Today, I'm very happy to welcome Vlad, uh, co-founder at fullfunnel.io as our guest. Um, Vlad, welcome to our show. I'm super excited to be here. Thanks for having me, Sammy. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you. Tell me about your company, Full Funnel. What are you doing? So we are helping B2B tech and service companies, usually companies with long and complex sales cycles, generate demand and opportunities and land opportunities with, let's say, mid-market and enterprise clients using Full Funnel account-based marketing. Mm -hmm. And what is your job at Full Funnel? Well... We are a small company. We are two co-founders, basically, with a, with a few people helping us. So my, my main areas of responsibility are sales and finance and also productizing, let's say, documenting the processes and productizing our services. But, you know, I do a lot of things together with my co-founder, Andrei Zinkevic, you know, like obviously like providing consulting uh, to our clients creating content, driving demand. Although for that, Andre is really uh, a star and, and driving good. that. Very good. We're going to deep dive into that and how you're also doing it for yourself later on. Can you give us a, a proxy of the size or growth of your company? Absolutely. So, you know, um, previously both Andre and I were kind of independent consultants. Uh, we had a very interesting project last year and we decided to join forces. And basically we only started in September last year, right? So we just started, but we are heading to 300K uh, this year, closing the, the year. I expect to close the year at around 300 uh, annual uh, revenue. Okay, very good. And what geographic markets are you serving? So we are focused on, we started in the Western Europe and now expanding uh, to the US as well. We have some clients there. I mean, we had clients really all over the world, but our focus is Western Europe and the US. Very good. It's quite, quite different, uh, US and Europe, I assume. Um, I'm going to have some questions there later, I'm pretty sure. Okay. Um, who's your ideal customer? You already said it's like basically these um, um, software as a service companies and IT service companies, correct? Well, yeah, I think like we, we say like B2B tech and service companies. So, like you said, service ID service companies like, uh, you know, providing specific services, usually, I don't know, uh, cybersecurity, you know, software development. We have several of those. We had several of those. But our main clients are B2B SaaS, enterprise SaaS, let's say. It can be like, you know, we had a client who was in Harvard, but really it's a B2B enterprise SaaS. Mm -hmm. And I can also say how I like basically saw you first time. It was LinkedIn. Huh? So um, I'm, I'm scanning LinkedIn daily. It's one of my daily routines in the morning. So post something, uh, look for interesting content that I like, engage a little bit. And I saw post, your post, I think, um, and I liked what you were writing and so I tagged you in one of my posts and you replied and this is how the whole conversation started. And I think you have, I mean, you're, you're still a small company, but you have interesting things that you're doing and how you're doing them. So I think everybody can learn from you. Um, and obviously also from the way you are engaging on LinkedIn because you caught my attention. So you must do some things, right? Um, so that's the power of social. Uh, you, you suddenly have a conversation with people that you didn't know before. It can be for a podcast like we have. It can also be for, um, yeah, having a potential client or even hiring people. So that's what I like about this platform. Absolutely. I, for, for us, it's, I mean, for me personally and, and for us as a company, it's, it's really the main platform that we use. And it's not only been a game changer in terms of like generating demand for our services, you know, getting name recognition, like brand recognition and, you know, all the, all the other benefits that you can have, but also like just on the personal level as well, it really helped me. I mean, you know, you're, you're creating some content and you're getting this feedback. It gives you a confidence boost. It gives you also a lot of feedback from the market of what's work, working, what's resonating, what's not. So I've been like, really like uh, feeling a bit transformed thanks to this experience in in some ways and like you say you meet amazing people and you know people say um, you're the average of what is it like five people that you, that you hang out with right 
And sometimes in our immediate environment, you may not have the opportunity to, you know, meet amazing people or you, know, you, you may, may, may meet them, but like uh, to, today you're able to connect to some of, the, some of the best brains in the industry, just, you know, through LinkedIn, posting, commenting, etc. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's start with um, a more general question first, and before we go into the social part. Um, B2B marketing is often driven um, to basically generate leads and is also measured by amount of leads. What is your take on that? Yeah, well, basically, um, it's even in our uh, it's even in our tagline, if you like, or in our headline on our website, uh, less leads, more revenue. So we are big believers in the fact that you know when you when the measure becomes a target, it it, it ceases to be a good measure. So uh, the problem with lead generation is that. Uh, in a lot of cases, the, the leads, the so-called leads or the MQLs are not really leads or opportunities. They are just contact. Somebody downloading an ebook is definitely, there is no buying intent there. So the problem is that it's also because it's so easy to measure, it's so easy to attribute, you know, companies tend to focus on that. And, you know, there is, I mean, with any other initiative, like for example, demand generation, account-based marketing, when you need to invest some time in the beginning and you know, it takes some time before you will see some results, uh, the results that you see with lead generation are obvious there. They come like they're linear. So the more you contact people, the more maybe whatever downloads, you know, responses or whatever you call the lead you will have. But the problem is, of course, that, that that doesn't reflect in revenue. I mean, I just recently did a, an analysis of a campaign, and this is like this is like very typical, right? So we'll start each engagement. We'll I will analyze what they're doing, what the client is doing right now, and it's an awesome client. They have like four or five thousand, you know, enterprise cost B two B mid size and enterprise customers. They are really well established. They're they're an awesome company. But for example, in the in their campaign, they were running a campaign of for four or five months. They spend about 20k on that campaign. Uh, it was like a Legion campaign. I think it was an ebook or something. And basically, there were uh, two or three opportunities. So after th four or five months, generating, I think it was like maybe even thousands of. It was above thousand of of contacts, leads, whatever you like to call them. Then really like good fit was around 400. But out of those 400 good fit leads actually there were maybe one or two real opportunities that came this way and and both of them like one of them just was a meeting that went cold so is it an opportunity probably not and then the other one uh was lost that's it so that's the result i'm not surprised by this by the way so mm -hmm. this is this is the status so this doesn't work and you know, um, the problem, the other problem with that is that, you know, for example, if it's just a cold outreach and you're doing that as lead generation, you're not only ineffective, you know, you're not only ineffective in, in, in getting the, 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 the right or I that you want to get out of, out of your marketing, but you're also basically burning your market. You're actually burning bridges with potential clients before you even had a chance to build them. So, I'm, as you can see, very passionate about that. You know, this is one of the big problems. And I think this problem is as well driven by the providers. It's a little bit like the, I always think of the golden rush, you know, in the United States when there was a golden rush and, you know, everybody was going to the, to the West Coast to, to, to dig gold, right? Who was actually the majority of people who got rich except for the few lucky ones who found gold, were actually the people selling the, the gold digging equipment, shovels, et cetera, right? And that's a bit like, this is what I see today. Well, today it's a bit changing, right? This is the last year I, I see a lot of evolution in a, good, in a good direction, but like the last probably five, six years, it's been all about this so-called gurus, lead generation, whatever, uh, growth hacking, et cetera, which was kind of, you know, people recognizing that opportunity and uh, getting basically money by uh, selling these uh, promises that are impossible to fulfill. Yeah, what I also saw, and it's even in one of our slides when we, and then we basically have conversations with potential uh, customers. So what we say is, 
before the internet era, so until like end of the 90s, basically, everything was relation-based or yes. more or less relation-based in the B2B setting. So you shook hands, you went out to dinner, you got to know each other, and, and then you made a deal, at least in the B2B setting with a little bit higher, higher volume. Then came this internet era, and suddenly it was super easy to contact thousands of people. So it became more a mass spamming exercise in the end. It was working in the beginning because nobody was doing it, and then you get results. And uh, But in, at the end of the last decade, basically, also even last year, um, people I talked to who did this, who were successful five years ago or four years ago, say it's not really working anymore. So... Um, for several reasons, um, and we don't have to go into each detail of the reasons, but um, I mean, even reg regulations go into this direction. And also LinkedIn did a change recently um, for allowing people, instead of like contacting a thousand people a month, down to around 400 people a month. So everybody, regulators, uh, the, the social networks, and even the customers, once they notice you basically have a... a mass customized email that basically everybody can receive you shut off most of the time even though it could be something interesting and so what we say the pendulum is swinging back a little bit into investing the effort and time to build relationships again absolutely no absolutely i mean you know we call it b2b but in the end you're you're not buying from companies you're buying from people are buying from people and they buy from people that they know like and trust right? And Absolutely. yeah, how, what, what is the most human way to build that relation, to build that trust and to get to know somebody while well, it's relationship. So absolutely, I'm 100% I'm, I'm with you. I don't think there can be, you know, another way to look at it as well, if, especially if you're selling, if you're selling high value, complex, you know, services and products, actually, I think there is a term in economics called credence goods. So that is to say goods that you cannot evaluate before you purchase, right? For example, you have this like huge software like in a factory and you have to install it before you can actually start seeing the ROI. So you have to trust. It's basing, you're, you're buying based on trust and, and there cannot be trust between two people if there, there isn't that relationship. I, I don't, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't think there is a worse way to start uh, a relationship that than with just uh, generic cold outreach. I think on the other hand, uh, a lot of people are talking about cold outreach as if, as if like uh, nothing can be cold. I think like all relationships start cold and there is a way to do outreach um, in a thoughtful way and that can actually work. But the way that this is done and in and, and, and on mass with automation tools, etc., is definitely, like you say, doomed to fail. Yeah. And I mean, we, we have a deeper look into this because this is also the core of our company, but it's not that much time that you have to invest. I mean, you, you contact less people, yes. But it's not like you have to invest one hour per person that you're contacting to find something useful to start a conversation and to bring some value to the table that is unique to that person. Um, you, you have to think about a framework first, how you generally can tackle certain profiles that you can put into a bucket. But then uh, it, it's still like it's easy to get going once you did the first two, three uh, of those people and that's at least what we are seeing but i'm i'm curious on on what how you're doing it um and um i mean can you give us um a proxy of of this of the amount of people that someone if, if i would work for you uh, not for you um if, if i would hire you basically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and i would say hey um vlad i would like to win b2b SaaS companies in europe um mm -hmm that have a minimum funding of 10 million upwards mm -hmm. um, as clients. What would be the steps that we take together? Okay, so I'm glad you asked this question. And, 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 and just to kind of like build on top of what you just said is people, people have this like scalability obsession. The people have this obs obsession about, and the way that they look at it is actually like they, they look in the wrong KPIs. You know, this is not like scalability. So automating everything uh, in the name of scalability, I don't think this is scalability. I, I'm sorry to say, but this is just laziness because uh, it's not about the time or the effort that you spend. It's about the return that you get, 
that is the that is the key so absolutely okay, going back to your question or what what would be the steps so the first steps would be obviously to nail like who is your target who is your ideal clients mm -hmm. and by that i mean really going very narrow down to the level of verticals and sub verticals you know whether it's I don't know whether you are into health tech companies, you know, health tech SaaS companies, whether you're into fintech, whatever. Maybe it would even be in your case because you're, um, you know, uh, because you're, you're selling services. Probably it would be also geographically language. You know, it would probably be in Germany, maybe even just like one part of Germany. Um, and then the the other thing is then. How do you do that? Like, how do you figure out what, uh, what is the best customer? I, and I'm a big believer in looking at the evidence and what is the best evidence is looking at your previous customers, right? Looking at, looking through your CRM and figuring out who are your best customers and then trying to find more of those. And like I said, to the level of, of vertical, to the level, we, we, we even like typically define like a, a series of maybe maybe up to 20 qualification and disqualification criteria. Obviously things like, you know, vertical, sub-vertical, you know, the size of the company, the geography, you know, uh, but then like on the level of disqualification criteria, it could be like in our case, it has to do a lot with, obviously it has to do a lot with the team structure, the number of sales and marketing people. But in, in our case, for example, we know that the background of the executive who is going to take a decision plays a big role. And, you know, for example, somebody who is coming from a sales and marketing, uh, has a sales and marketing experience is not necessarily the best decision maker if they're a CEO. Or, I mean, weird things like that. So we know, uh, obviously, that, you know, what type of clients do they have, et cetera. So nailing this disqualification criteria so that actually, you know, what we would be looking to is to build a list of maybe 20, 30, maximum 50 accounts. So mm -hmm. we wouldn't even be like looking at, you know, like some criteria that you can use and plug in into ads or like generating lists like that. But really like, I mean, I just, we just started, the, we just started two pilot campaigns uh, with two clients and one had... Uh, depending on the kind of campaign that we ran, but like with one, we had 28 accounts in the campaign with the other one. I believe we started, we started with, if I'm not mistaken, like 10 in Belgium and 10 in the UK, they're mm -hmm. Belgium based company. So, and the list can be as small as that. And so that is, I mean, if you want to nail and, and really land big opportunities, you, you want to maximize you want to stack the odds in your favor and stacking the odds in your favor is like the, the most important thing is selecting these accounts mm -hmm. uh the other thing is how do you position yourself like how do you that would be the next thing like how do you why do the customers buy from you and how do they buy from you and the best way to figure that out is to just go and interview them and talk to them like we have you know usually uh we have like these, these lists of questions up to 70 questions that we ask. If you want, we could share this afterwards with oh, the audience. Oh, that would be amazing. I will put yeah, it sure. into the show Absolutely. Yes. Um, it, and and, and doing, during those interviews, what you're asking is basically you want to understand what their goals and challenges were or are, what their priorities are, what are the trigger points um, to start thinking about a product like you, yours. Then, of course, the whole buying process, how do they go about, you know, figuring out who the providers are, what kind of information do they need, what kind of information do their decision makers, their colleagues are asking for. Uh, and obviously, very important is like, why do they buy from, why did they buy from you? Why did they choose to work with you, not with your competitors? What, what doubts and objections they might have had beforehand, et cetera, et cetera. So you want to figure that out. And based on that, so again, we are targeting a, a narrow vertical, a narrow ICP, and we are tweaking our value proposition, our positioning for that specific like vertical so that you kind of become what I call like a natural choice for them, right? So yeah. that- And, and just you know, for everybody who doesn't know it, ICP is basically ideal customer profile. Thank you, yes. So it's, um, I always have in mind that we have a broader um, uh, listenership and viewership so that everybody can understand um, but it's natural. Um, so you, I understand that you you figured out which company 
and you i assume you also figure out which person in this company you want to target or maybe it's different personas within one company um can you go yes, into into absolutely this, because absolutely that's what i'm super interested in uh, how, how you're doing that so it's it's like you say it's actually like today's buyers especially enterprise the bigger the company the more buyers it will have like anywhere between six to ten buyers even more for bigger companies and these are people and obviously there are different types of buyers you have your champions people who are going to champion your solution internally uh, you will have influencers so people who somehow influence the decision maybe they will be asked for an advice maybe these will be people who are participating in meetings um, and then a special type of influencer is a blocker so who is the person who is going to block the deal and then obviously the decision maker the one who is you know signing the dotted line so these are kind of the rough i i assume like a lot of people know this like the, the rough categorization of the different buyers but you know a lot of companies make the mistake of only prospecting the decision makers and it's hard to prospect decision makers and to get their time and it's um actually it's it's also like a missed opportunity because and you actually this could be your advantage if you if you like as a sales rep in in, in getting getting in touch with other buyers and the, and the, the, the key there is that not only that you're generating more conversations and more potential opportunities, but you're also learning about your target account. You're learning about their needs. You're learning about how they are thinking, what stage they're in, what, you know, um, what, what potentially other, other alternatives they are considering, what's important to them, what their purchase criteria are. And that's all, I mean, super important for your uh for your sales and and for your marketing as well mm -hmm. so now let's assume um i have my 20 accounts that i want to win i know that for example i have um, these different kind of personas i have for example to make it simple and a little bit relatable um in my in in our case for example we we could target the the head of sales Yeah, but um, usually I know that when we are in conversations, they usually bring in marketing as well. And at some point, the CEO is the one who also has to decide and he could be the blocker. Um, and so it would be three personas um, that and maybe even a fourth one, namely the, the sales rep itself. So the mm -hmm. person that will profit from, from the leads we generate. So we would have four personas. And we, we know now these in these 20 accounts, we can through, for example, LinkedIn, you can really say this is uh, in this account, this is like, these are the five, six, seven people that I want to engage. What do we do next? What do we do next? So in the next stage, what you want to do is you want to warm up somehow. You, you need some, some sort of a warm up campaign, a warm up program uh, to engage with those clients. And well, with the buyers let's let's call them like that so and and there are different plays that you can you can use in there and so the one for example we are now doing a podcast interview so you can invite your buyers to your podcast and you can talk to them and build a relationship super powerful super powerful I've, i can tell you i've done i know i've done the i've done this like last year I've done a pilot campaign for, for our, when we've just started, I, in, I had a, a target list of 21 accounts and I did, I think I did like eight or so interviews. We ended up landing two clients and generating about six opportunity and landing two clients from there. Some of the opportunities are still active. You know, one of them may close by the end of the summer, etc. So this is, This is just one example of how you might do a warm up. Uh, we do, for example, we, I mean, this is just one instance of creating content with your uh, pot potential buyers. We also run research uh, campaigns and market research campaigns where we are, write articles. So a lot of articles that I write are actually based on conversations that I had with people or I just asked them and we do a study. We recently published, so we did, we ran such a research last year and published Uh, first initially in Rev Genius because that was a, a target community as well as well on the website. But then uh, we even got uh, Andre got the, the 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 article published in CXL Conversion Excel, which is like a big publication for us. So um, this works really well as well. Um, you know, you can obviously also LinkedIn as well is a powerful platform, like you mentioned, right? And in, instead of 
and what was really cool about LinkedIn, like the first time I, and I thought about it is like, you know, I was, I was working with the client. He was really good at content marketing, right? And he was good at, you know, producing a lot of content, speaking in conferences and worked really well for them. But the leads that they were getting via the website, I remember like more than a few thousand leads. I mean, rarely they would convert. And most of them were actually even irrelevant because, you know, they came through SEO, maybe Twitter and, and stuff like that. And what's really amazing about LinkedIn is that it's like, it's like a very targeted content platform, right? It's extremely targeted. And so what can you do as well is, of course, you can start conversations. Maybe you can, if, if, if your targets are, are active on LinkedIn and posting, you can actually start conversations in comments, engage with their content and their posts. You can create personalized um, posts that are related to their industry, their, even their company maybe, and, and tag them in there. Uh, ask their opinion. Of course, if you're doing your podcast or, or market research or whatever else, of course, this, this gives you a, <laughs> lots of opportunities to then engage them using that content, insights, etc. cetera, on, on LinkedIn as well. You can start conversations. There is many ways that you can actually warm up and engage your clients. So that will be the next step, right? Mm -hmm. And then- you get it. And I can just tell you, it was like only- uh -huh. A little bit more than two years ago that I um, like first opened the sales navigator, like the sales tool from LinkedIn that you can buy for yeah. a couple of euros a month. And I was like amazed by how good you can select your ideal customers there. And you get a list of people with the names, with the companies, and you even can engage with them directly. And I thought, wow. And that is only costing like the 60, 70 euros a month from LinkedIn, that is amazing. And that was not possible like 10, 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, uh, that's super powerful. So um, just in this sense, uh, we can all be happy that uh, something like LinkedIn is existing and we can leverage it as well. I know, absolutely, absolutely. And the, the powerful thing about LinkedIn as well is that, you know, we, we spoke about creating a target list of accounts. But as well, what happens on LinkedIn, if you are creating content, if you're trying some demand, and usually the way that we do this is, let's say, 40-40-20 rules. So 40% expert posts that um, demonstrate our expertise, 40 are kind of engagement posts where we are purposefully trying to engage our audience, and 20% are some sort of promotional posts, maybe promoting mm -hmm. some content, not promoting, you know, just directly like you know, trying to sell, of course, that we know that doesn't work. But what's happening is that you are, um, sometimes you might see that somebody is engaging, looking at your profile, commenting, liking, whatever, you know, you can even like see the views of, of your uh, posts. And of course, like sometimes they go and visit your website as a result, of, a result of that. And if you have IP identification software, you can see which companies are engaging. And so we call those engagement triggers, right? And so what we, I mean, even if they're not on your target list, you can take those accounts, if they fit your qualification and disqualification, selection and disqualification criteria and add them to your list. There's not yet buying intent necessarily, right? But there is some engagement, there is some intent, there are some signals, and you can then build on that engagement and start conversations, start, you know, start turning that into conversations eventually, eventually into clients. So this is another powerful thing about LinkedIn. A lot of people don't really uh, um, understand, you know? And so that's the first part, right? And then the question then becomes is, okay, so, but how do you then turn that engagement conversation? How do you turn that into an actual sales opportunity? That's where the, yes. the gold yes. is, right? I want to know, tell us. <laughs> <laughs> Now, similar to the engagement triggers, you have the buying intent, you know, and the buying intent uh, can be in different ways. You know, one thing we always do is we always do research. We always research our, our target accounts. And like you mentioned, it doesn't have to take a long time, you know, even like in a half an hour, one hour, you can get like, I'm talking about an account, not about necessarily just the people. You can get a lot of information nowadays about you know their strategic initiatives you know maybe them landing some interesting clients or you know projects that they are planning to run uh you know 
for technical companies like roadmaps, etc. Yeah, go ahead. You want yeah, to see. you can even you can even have a look at if it's uh, important for you um, how the employee growth is is like is it going up is it going down? You see it directly on LinkedIn if you have like the Sales Navigator for example. Um, so there's I, I, I'm with you. There's a lot of information out there if you just know what to look for. Mm -hmm. So my question here would be. Do you, before you start this, the search, do you first sit down with your clients and say, okay, um, what could be triggers for you? What, what is important for you? Or do you just first to explore, explore like, how do you do it? Let's, yeah. let's ask an open question. Yeah. No. So absolutely. Like what you said, uh, I mentioned already in the interviews, we are going to be asking about the triggers, right? We are going to be asking their best clients, uh, about those triggers. We also try we also have a, a session where we map the customer journey, the buying journey, where we start from like, what could be all the different triggers? Okay, so, and what, ha what happens ne next? And then what happens next? So trying to figure out like, what are the, all the, the different steps that the buyers go through um, as they are discovering, considering, and, and, and evaluating solutions like yours. And so that gives you obviously a lot of insight into what could be the trigger. It gives you, of course, input to maybe create content around that. And so they can influence that buying process, but also gives you the insight into what kind of information you could be looking for. So for example, for one client, um, one thing that we realized is that they were hiring this, it was an IT service company specialized in ad tech, ad advertisement technology. And especially they were, what they're, let's say USP was the reason why a lot of customers were buying from them was their expertise in mobile SDK, right? So that was something that was very specific. Now, what's cool about it is that you can mine the profiles of the employees and figure out whether they have experience with mobile SDK. You can simply like search, use these keywords to figure out whether they are doing that. And so that was like a very nice way for us to be able to detect whether there is a good fit already from 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 just pure pure search like that that's um, really cool and uh, one other idea i just want to throw in mm -hmm. is uh, look for job ads um where you can yes. also see do they look for people that have for example the special knowledge yeah absolutely but also i mean like the 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 the, the, the low-hanging fruit is I don't know, like um, we are working with a company in the construction space and obviously their clients being the construction companies, like winning new projects, these projects are planned up front. They always announce it. You know, we can use that in our outreach to personalize. Obviously, you know, we know what kind of challenges that they will face. Uh, you have a lot of information nowadays when people are appearing on podcasts, you want to <laughs> If your target audience is somewhere interview, being interviewed on a podcast as for an article, I once had um, uh, a, a person, uh, well, a, a potential buyer, right? Uh, uh, actually a decision maker, a CEO of a company uh, that I was targeting. And I found an article and he was talking about how, you know, in, like he was talking about how important some specific trade shows were, were for them, like in this industry. And I know these trade trade shows were canceled, right? So, so this was, and so, I mean, and then later, okay, I actually had him on the podcast, and we were chatting about it, and I was asking him. I didn't ask him publicly, but before, you know, like in a pre-interview, like we you and I had, asked him about it, and he said, "Well, indeed, like we used to get like most of our business for this from these two trade shows, and now we're looking into building an inbound marketing strategy." So that was like immediately like a big insight for me into how I can, like, yes, there is an opportunity. And yes, I know exactly how I can position my services instead of just saying something generic, I can talk about that specific problem that they're trying to solve. So there is a lot of information out there that you can use to research. By the way, again, speaking to people by, for example, creating content or like podcast, whatever interview, speaking to them. For me, this is the best kind of research. That's also why you want to connect to different buyers because you may get different in kinds of pieces of information from different people. That's probably the best research that you can run. So then what you do is instead of reaching out cold, um, you know, a lot of times during the warm up, during the, all these like demand generation, during all these actions that you do, you will get, you will be getting also in, inbound inquiries, mm -hmm. but just relying on inbound inquiries is leaving money on the table, right? 
And so what you're trying to do then in the next step is then is reaching out to them and, and creating the, the, the sales opportunity. And the way that we do this often is personalized outreach. And we often use direct mail because not a lot of people are doing direct mail. You can, afford to do it. Yeah. you can afford to do it. If your targets are 20 accounts, you know, you may, may maybe after research, you're, you're not narrowing this down. You can be doing, you know, um, an, an example campaign. And I'm, I'm, so this was just purely cold. There was no warm up. We had 30 accounts in the, in the pilot and we had zero warm up. And there was actually personalization was not even on the level of individual. The personalization was on the level of, uh, you know, different, we, we narrowed down the target very, very well. So it was based on the, the target vertical and the types of people that we were reaching out to. Mm -hmm. And so even without any outreach, even without personalization with the direct mail, we had so 12 out of, uh, so close to 40% of people responded and half of them became opportunities. Now, what did you send? Uh, okay. <laughs> so actually it was, so we were targeting three types of, uh, we had C, uh, C, uh, CEO, CTO and HR actually, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because they were involved in, in hiring process. And we sent actually... <laughs> Each of the each of the um, uh, personas, if you like, each of the buyers, we bought like a, a small super uh, superhero figurine. Like for example, the HR, she got a superwoman because, and we had, and we built a story around that because, and and I think like an aspirin because they were health in the health industry, so it was like something a bit a bit surprising to get, and then. You know, we would build a metaphor, in, so we would send a letter uh, next to that where we would build a metaphor. So, what do uh, you know? Our services and your um, uh, the the aspirin and the superwoman uh, have in common, and then we would build a metaphor around it because you know HR they they are, they have so many responsibilities. They are like a, she's like a superwoman, whatever. Like so. It's, it's a personalized little, it's not, so, but that's like 100% that they will open it because it's not just like, it's not junk mail, it's like personalized. And also because it's like something like that, they are, they are going to read it, right? And what happened at the end is like I, like I said, out of, out of 30, we had 12 of them respond. Not, not everybody was positive, but we had six opportunities. And we, we How never did they wrote respond? This. Just, uh, I'm really curious here. Did you okay, send so like, because, in the letter, did you have like a, an email address or a telephone number? Or how did you trigger basically them doing something? Well, actually doing a, follow, uh, a sales follow-up. This is where the magic happens. Ah, okay. Because, I mean, again, if you just rely, of course you will get, I mean, for example, um, that, that prospect that I mentioned where I, um, uh, where we figured out that the trade shows were canceled, etc. I figured out he was into alpine biking, right? I see that you have some Alps, I think, in the background. Maybe you're into yes. it as well. I bought him a book about Alpine biking, about the best tours, and I wrote a letter, et cetera. And he responded himself, like he, he, he responded himself. But again, just waiting for that would also be leaving money on your table. So you want to close yes. the loop. And so yes. what we do usually is we, we organize a personalized sales, sales follow-up where we then, and it's not a cold call because, you know, they've just received your parcel, you know, you've been notified. You can call them about it and you can start conversation around that. And that's where actually you're, you're starting to create uh, uh, opportunities. And this is something we're never going to write because, I mean, it just does, doesn't seem believable. But I later heard that all these six opportunities are actually closed. Which is not something that happens. I mean, it's not something I can but it, it, It's not up to you anymore. At some point, it's also, do they really have a pressing problem and is this the perfect solution? So I understand that this can happen, but it's not yeah, usually no, the case. Not something that, yeah. Um, but it's a really, it's what, what I like about it. So let, let me try to deconstruct it a little bit. So on the, because we're always selling to humans, let's go back to this basic notion. Everybody loves to receive gifts. Everybody. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if it's a thoughtful gift, even yes. better. Yes. Um, yes. And if yes. it's something handmade and thoughtful, that's like super powerful in the end. And handmade is maybe something written, uh, however you can do it. And you will also, uh, just a side note, you will receive um, a handmade gift after the podcast okay. from us, from Munich, <laughs> uh, like every yeah. guest. 
And I can tell you the response rate is super high without even us like going after, but we get super great responses, super personalized ones. And um, the second one is, and that's something I heard recently, strike while the iron is hot. So once you know someone viewed your video or received a gift or like did something and you know they did it, then as you said, it doesn't feel like a cold call anymore. You can pick up the phone and you can call them and uh, where the basic first uh, few words are around the trigger event, you know? Uh, did you receive it? Did you like it? What do you think about the story? And then of course, you, you once you get a conversation flowing, you can you can basically, how do you do it? Like, well, you actually call, it's very simple. Your, it's yeah, actually yeah. very simple because you have sent them also the personalized pitch. You have sent it mm -hmm. along with a gift, right? So you can ask them about the gift, what they thought about it, etc. You can ask about whether they received and whether they reviewed the proposal. If they have, then you can start conversation about it. Well, proposal, it's really kind of like a, like a super personalized um, cold letter. I mean, it's not like I can, can call it cold email, right? But uh, we can start a conversation. If they haven't, you can briefly, you know, you can briefly summarize your value proposition, what you can do for them and start from there. But basically mm -hmm. what this allows you to do is that, of course, you, you can, you can simply start a conversation about what do you think about it? Do they have a need instead or start, start in there. But then also let's say that they don't, or they didn't like it or they didn't, whatever. Um, that's, a, that's like, for example, if you're doing a cold email campaign, whatever other online campaign that you're doing without this this one-on-one -on -one call, you're getting a binary feedback. You're getting a yes or a no. You never get a, a why. You, you know, you may kind of send a follow-up email and ask them, but yeah, who will respond? No, nobody to that? Responds. Nowadays, nobody will. So, but when you, once you have them on the phone, you can you can ask them all these questions, and maybe you will uncover some objections. So we usually prepare very well. We thought of, think about it upfront, like what are the possible objections, and what are the ways in which we can um, try to diffuse those, obje those objections or find out more information or whatever, right? But um, what's important is that even if it's like a not a fit or whatever, you can get that valuable feedback so that you can maybe add a new qualification or disqualification criteria in the future. Maybe you need to tweak your pitch. Maybe you need to tweak your, you know, your, your, your script, et cetera. But that is the information that you will never get without that one-on-one -on -one conversation. Yeah, so like uh, it's extremely lot, yeah. powerful. And um, the, the second part that I like about this whole story, uh, sending these personalized gifts is well, the story in itself. It's like on LinkedIn, huh? you, you're really good at it and your colleague too. Um, how do you capture attention? How do you do that? Um, and I think it's no matter what channel you use, you have to use some storytelling tricks. You, you first have to have a showstopper so that people stop yeah, and they, they take the time to read it. And then it has to be engaging and it has to be so interesting that they keep on reading or keep on looking at the video or whatever you do. So uh, the one thing is personalization. The second one is tell a story around what you do because everybody loves a good story. Yeah, and, and what's really cool about these personalized gifts, if they're like one-on-one -on -one personalized, like I mentioned that book about Alpine, Alpine biking, I can tell a story about how B2B sales and, and, and cycling are, um, you know, what, is, what do they have in common? And because that's a, that's a topic of their interest, the story will definitely, they will want to read the story, right? So there's, there is definitely an easy, um, how do you call it, showstopper or a, a way to grab their attention. I mean, but I like can you tell said, you, if, if someone would send me something about, I, I'm deep into triathlon, so swimming, biking, running. So if someone would think about something and send me something, I would definitely have a look at it. And if it makes sense, and it's not just a bullshit gift, but something that really someone thought, well, what could someone who likes triathlon use or like, then I would definitely respond. Even if I'm not interested in the product, I would appreciate that someone took the time, thought about something, and I, I like that, you know, and I think many people would too. And especially, especially because the default is this like cold generic messages that you're learned to ignore. So as long as like the 99.9% .9 of people are doing that, that's like a huge opportunity for everybody else who, everybody else who puts a little bit more effort in. So you're yeah. immediately standing, like you said, you're immediately standing out. 
so and and that's the other part that we can we can also learn from from what you said is so the one thing is what what do you do um, so basically the content and that can be physical like you send a gift or something else and the other one is which channels and going like multi or omni channel not mm -hmm. everybody responds to one channel Absolutely. I, i mean i have cases where someone didn't respond to email but responded on linkedin and the other way around and then other people responded on a whatsapp message Absolutely. and no. and, 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 and you yes. know you you never know and and so I get the feeling from all the interviews I'm doing that um, that you have just to 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 try to hit not uh, not not all of them, but but different kinds of of trigger triggers because people are wired differently. And so some people like images, some people like videos, some people like text, some people like different channels. Um, so that's something that you can definitely play around with. And I mean, the the the, the hard part is that you have to have a I think you have to sit down before you start and 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 have an assumption on on what can work and then A/B test it a little bit. Otherwise, you're shooting all over the place and you it's it's getting totally confusing. But once you do that, it's really powerful. And one story that you just reminded me of another podcast guest of ours, um, the CEO of Credit Chef, Daniel. Um, they have as a target market uh, small and medium enterprises and the owners there and. It's more a really more of a really traditional uh, segment that they are targeting, and those guys are not really online. They are not really on LinkedIn. So, what was their most successful channel? It's sending a fax. Yeah. So they send a fax uh, to those people, and first they send a fax with a reply email, which didn't work. Then they send a fax, and they send two two pages: one page with a proposal, the second page where they could fill out with a pen and fax it back yes and that worked yeah <laughs> no I'm, i'm i totally agree with you with, with respect to multi-channel follow-up um you know i always like if somebody doesn't respond to an email try the linkedin messages i might record a little i'm doing my daily walks on the beach here and i'm, I'm just gonna record a short video 30 seconds or whatever send them that whatsapp obviously like you know uh, it's another channel and Yeah, also like every time I get in contact with somebody, I try also kind of tr test different channels to see where they respond the best and remember that. And then like also kind of warm up these different channels as well. So I totally agree. And like you say, like different people like different types of like formats of content. Some people like to listen. I like to listen to audiobooks. I'm not such a big reader, but I listen to tons of audiobooks. Uh, you know, videos, I prefer actually reading than just watching, whatever, like everybody has their own preferences, just different types of brains, right? And so, yeah, that's your, that's 100%. So, um, what, what is like the, the biggest learning that you took out of um, the last like six or 12 months that you went into and deep into the root of ABM? Okay. Well, I think the the biggest learning is that you need to sell the way that the customers are buying, right? I know, I mean, it's a generic one, but really that is the key, uh, that is the key point. And the way that customers are buying is changing. Uh, it, it was changing and it has changed even more, of course, during the, during the last year where, for example, your buyers couldn't get around the water cooler and have informal chats. They relied much more on zoom meetings that nobody likes to be at etc cetera, etc cetera. so you need to be aware of all these things if you want to be successful mm -hmm. yeah it sounds easy <laughs> but you have to stop before you start running and really do it um, i can i can absolutely agree with that one and also what you said in the beginning taking the time to really hone into who's your really yes. ideal customer group who's your ideal buyer And because if you watch this one and think, wow, I don't really want to spend like hours doing this. And then it usually doesn't work. No, that, that is, these are absolutely, these are two key points. Like, and it has to do with the mindset as well, right? You have the mindset of what we call like the company centric mindset, where you're trying to sell the way 
the trying to market the way that you want to sell, right? Because ah, you have a nice funnel and it like maps to your CRM or whatever. I have an automatic LinkedIn outreach campaign. Why aren't you not buying? <laughs> 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 yeah, absolutely get it. Um, people are wise. That's the mindset. And the yeah. other mindset as well, like you mentioned is as well, is like the scalability mindset, the scalability obsession. And it's like, if you don't take the time to, and like also like just wanted quick result, wanting quick results. And I'm really amazed at how, you know, most people would be like, if you, if, if somebody falls for a get quick, uh, get rich quickly scheme, you know, most people mm -hmm. will be like, ah, you're so naive. But then in marketing and sales, they expect actually something like that. Right. Yeah. So this, there is also this mindset of like expecting, expecting quick results, not thinking long-term. And these are like very, very harmful and, you know, at the end don't work. Yeah, I can tell you, we also learned um, on our journey, we all companies only two and a half years old now, um, but we also learned um, how we have to sell so that we have the right mindset. It's also part of how you set, set everything up. And um, we did it wrong in the beginning. Um, so we, we basically said, yeah, we, you can on average get this kind of amount of leads. And so they only looked at the leads and... Yes. Um, and that, that was sometimes really bad because they created a lot of pipeline uh, with, with, because pipeline is basically the, for us, it's a rated expected value that you cannot get out of a client. So for example, if you have a $1 million deal or Euro deal and the chance of closing is 10%, you created 100,000 of mm -hmm. pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, so this is for, in our case, a much better uh, proxy. I mean, the best one in the end is revenue, but in a B2B setting for most of our clients, it takes like half a year to one and a half years until you move someone from the first conversation to where well, I have everyone on the table um, and, and they all agree and we can sign a deal. So um, so we started out with focusing on leads when we when we saw it and now we are not doing that, that uh, anymore and um, more focusing on educating um, and that's also something that surprised me. I'm new to sales uh, in a sense, so I didn't learn it and I wasn't a salesperson um, by trade before, but um, many people who sell don't have this mindset of looking at pipelines. So they usually took the wrong decision when they decided between alternative choices because they just looked at, for example, leads as a main KPI. Um, so I, I was quite surprised that many really smart people, uh, and because we also have like, we have B2B SaaS and management consultant companies as clients and those people that are leading those companies, they're super smart. Mm -hmm. But in yeah. this sense, they weren't educated enough. Yeah. yeah well, um, yes, yes, yes. And actually sometimes even like the fact that you don't come from sales can be an advantage, right? Because you're not like, mm, you don't carry those preconceptions with you. So sometimes you, you do things right just because you don't know that you shouldn't be doing it like that, right? So another another thing that I also found um, is that, you know, in terms of like short-term versus long-term, et cetera, you have, like you say, you have long sales cycles and you're, you know that the majority of our market is not sales ready, right? You, you, you It's like a very, very small amount of people. And so another principle that we all, always try to apply is never stop nurturing, right? So the fact that somebody wasn't like out of those, whatever, 20, 30 accounts that we were speaking about uh, uh, earlier, the fact they didn't respond to that campaign doesn't mean anything. It means probably that it's just not the right time. And we then what we do is we always run different kinds of campaigns and we like taking it from one and putting it in another and then trying to activate them in another moment, et cetera. So we, we had, you know, clients reaching out to us after being, you know, up to two years, like six months, seven, you know, up to two years uh, following us on LinkedIn or, or reading our newsletter or whatever. And then f finally, like, okay, you, <laughs> reaching out because the timing is right, but also because we didn't let them forget. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that yeah is... that's a really good point. And uh, there are several ways on how to do it, but... Um... But I absolutely get what you're saying. You have to, uh, as I said, most people don't have the problem at this moment of time. So it's natural that only one to 3% usually um, of potential buyers can buy right now. 
And the other 97%, if you do it in your approach, basically like providing some value and doing it thoughtfully, um, you don't burn them. So yeah, exactly. You, exactly, you can re-approach them. And, exactly. and, and, and the goal of the whole exercise is to be top of mind once they have the problem. It doesn't exactly. mean that you're the only one they're thinking about, but you should be on the short list. And then you yeah, have that one. Makes, yeah, that, that, is, that is the best, yes, that, that, that is the best outcome. Although if you did really nail your positioning and, and you're doing it right, etc., cetera, it, it does happen. It does happen to us. Actually, it happens often that, that um, we are, you know, people approach us and they don't even consider others. That happens. I mean, that but is the nicest case, yeah. That is the nicest case. That is the nicest case, of course. Um, but, you know, the best case is like you say, they've been following you, doing exactly what you did. They read all your case studies, they know, and they come down on the meeting. I mean, I mean, it's like they're, they're selling themselves. You, don't, <laughs> you just need, you just, the only thing you should do is not screw up, <laughs> like basically, <laughs> right? But, uh, but of course, like in most B2B cases, you know, they will need to have, you know, that different like vendors, like, uh, and selecting and comparing them, et cetera. Yeah. But ending on that short list is super, super, super hard. So yes. uh, that's a great outcome. Yes. And as you said, I mean, we experienced it uh, too. We have a few big, big clients uh, like Siemens, for example, and there it's like they have to have an alternative. They are not allowed to buy your service if yes. they don't come with any kind of alternative um, be because that's their policy. That's how it is. That's exactly. Yeah. Or like uh, any like government agency, like they're even by obliged by law to have two or three or whatever uh, when it's above certain budget. So yeah. And yeah, these big companies are a little bit like uh, small countries sometimes. Yeah, true. <laughs> in it's true. In terms yeah. of administration and bureaucracy. Yeah, it's true. So, um, are you ready for our five rapid fire questions now? <sighs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very Let's good. Go. So, first question What do you do to keep body and mind fit and sharp? Okay, so I have this daily routine where I go for a walk. I mentioned it down the beach. I like to swim and cycle. I always make friends. I always make time for my friends and my family, obviously, and is a top of priority. And recently, uh, after a long, long, long break, I started playing drums again, and this gives me a lot of joy as well. Cool. Um, what's uh, do you have a favorite business book? <laughs> it's very hard to pick one, right? I love, for example, Cialdini's Six Principles of Influence. Mm, to sell is human by Daniel Pink. Um, we also read a really good book uh, for for any consulting or expertise type of company called The Business of Ex Expertise by David Baker. It's not a very well known book, but it's excellent. Uh, another deep work by Cal Newport. I have a lot of them. It's not like I have one that is really a favorite one. Mm -hmm. Cool. And do you have someone um, like a business leader that you like to follow? You know, I have a bunch of people that I really like to follow. And as I was thinking about it, uh, like a business leader, like a role model or, or, or so, not, necess not really. But for example, I love the work of Josh Brown. He's a uh, sales uh, cold calling and cold emailing guru. Gaetano Dinardi from Nextiva. He, I love his posts. I love his thoughts, uh, especially when he started chatting with Chris Walker. I maybe like one business leader that I really like and follow is James Carberry. He has an agency, podcasting agency. I know that you know him. <laughs> yeah, we had, um, we, we had uh, them on our very first podcast show. Ah, there you go. We, as, as they guest. were, okay, so you started like we, we had them, they were our first guest as well. <laughs> they are <laughs> amazing. They I them. truly can say they're really, really helpful, nice people, and they do a great job. They are lovely people. They're lovely yes. people. I love also how he's building the company, but also his like just ethics and the way that he does business, the way that he, you know, I, I just he's just awesome people. Yes, definitely. Um, so that's uh, as a little side note, being nice can be really a good principle in business. Oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> um, so who should be our next podcast guest and why? Well, I'd say Andrei Zinkevich, not just because he's my co-founder, <laughs> but really um, he's probably the most practical, no BS uh, 
guy when it comes to marketing, uh, B2B marketing, and he has so many good case studies and he's like a great thinker. I think your guests will enjoy his insights. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot for that tip. And um, well, now you can directly address our audience, anything that we can help you with. Okay. Well, if you did like this episode, I would like to ask you to give Sammy and his podcast a thumbs up and a review if you can. I know that he's doing a lot of work to find, prepare these podcast interviews and share these insights with you. And I'm sure that because I know it from my experience, he would much, very much appreciate, you know, a like and a review on the podcast. That is the first time. Thank you so much for that one. Um, nobody gave it gave it back to me in this in this spot. So, uh, <laughs> very cool gesture, Vlad. Um, where can people get in touch with you best? I think the best is on my LinkedIn profile. If you want to drop it in the podcast description and comments. Yeah, uh, yeah I will do that best, yeah. because it's kind of hard for people to. to uh, it's Vladimir Blagojevich, but. <laughs> Very good, very good. Um, but but then uh, well, it's it's easier. Just show, uh, look into the show notes. We directly put the link in there, and then you can find them. And of course, once we post stuff, we will directly tag you on LinkedIn so people have direct access to you. All right. So thanks a lot. That's it for now. Um, it was really insightful. I learned a lot about account-based marketing, and it was a pleasure to have you on our show. Thanks a lot, Vlad. Thank you very much. It was uh, an absolute blast. Super. Cool.